Now, um, as uh, Patrick said, our, uh, our next speaker on the morning session is, uh, is something of a superstar in this area. I think you describe him as the Messiah. Uh, he's looking suitably abashed. Uh, just tell him about the Messiah in your CV. Uh, but um, he is, uh, he's come all the way from Yorkshire, and we're very grateful to talk to us this morning. Uh, I'll just run through his CV very quickly. It's as long as your arm, basically. Uh, he's Professor of Experimental Haematology an honorary consultant haematologist at Leeds uh, Teaching Hospital NHS, uh, NHS Trust. Yeah, since 1995, he has pioneered the use of minimal residual disease, or MRD assessment in CLL. Now, we know that um, MRD is the major cause of relapse in cancer and leukemia. He also chairs the National Cancer Research Institute CLL subgroup in the UK, responsible for development of CLL uh, clinical trials. He's the chief investigator for several NCR trials in relapsed and refractory CLL and for two proposed phase three trials for previously untreated patients with CLL. That is my very long way of saying it. He is a very, very busy man. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Peter Hill. Thank you very much. And following Patrick's always difficult, but it's easier to join, join the day rather than later on at night when he uh, starts singing and things. <laughs> <laughs> Should I say that for all your patients? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. We, um, I think, uh, thanks to Michael and Jan for inviting me over. The, the advocate groups for all our diseases, leukemia, CLL, are really becoming very important. In the UK, we have a very strong advocacy group for the last 10 years and they're important on many levels in terms of you know you guys are, are why we're here and what and why we're trying to get all these new therapies rapidly in you know to patients and uh, um, part of that is access to drugs once we get the trials done there's no point in us doing trials and proving we can cure or or get very prolonged remissions in, in patients if we can't use the drugs for everybody when they get through and also if, uh, the support of patients is very important. In, in the UK we have uh, patients on all of our trial groups, on all our monitor trials and design trials and also uh, support the things like NICE and the approval. So, so I, I commend you to sort of support the effort really because I think you're very important in it. This is Leeds. As you can see it's always, the sun's always shining in Leeds. Uh, I'm a Manchester United fan so if you uh, should tell that now should I? But, uh, but uh, <laughs> living in Leeds is very difficult because uh, they don't seem to like us very much. So. Um, and uh, I have the pleasure of, of chairing the UK group for CLL, uh, as Patrick said, uh, short, I think. So um, I'm going to try and uh, I'm going to try and cover the uh, sort of the developments of CLL. I normally draw pictures, but the audience is too big, big to do that. So I'm going to put some slides together. But I think the, the way to think about the treatment of diseases like CLL is, is that you have to understand the disease to be able to treat it effectively. And what's changed in the last few years is a really deep understanding of not just CLL, but particularly CLL, that's allowed us to develop new therapies. So it's a bit like mending a car. I don't understand much about cars, but if my car's broken, uh, someone tries to explain to me what's wrong with it. Unless I know how it works, there's no way that anyone's going to repair it. And that's the same thing with leukemia cells. We have to work out what's gone wrong with the leukemia cell so we can put it right and, and have effective therapy. Um, the and all the, some of the, the techniques that Patrick showed you with, the, with understanding the genes that steer the cells are, are really how we understand what's gone wrong with the, with, the, with the cell. And if you think about the CLL cell, what the CLL cell, the CLL is the most common leukemia, it's a, if you like, an overgrowth of a particular type of cell, a B cell, which makes antibodies. And if we don't have B cells, we run into lots of problems. So B cells are our immune system. So we have to be able to they recognize, if you like, any bacteria, virus that we, that we get, and then they kill it. And then they remember that, that you've had that uh, infection, and then they're waiting around to, to stop it happening again. So if you think about that process, it's really difficult, because we have to identify things we've never seen before, react to them within days, get rid of all the infection, and then live forever, the cells, to, to fight off the infection later on. And actually, that those features of a B cell mean that, that they're really dangerous cells to have in our body. But without them we don't survive till, till actually until we're born. So, so we, we pay at the cost of fighting infections with the, the development of these sorts of illnesses, lymphomas and leukemias later on. And uh, that's partly why CLL happens later on, because it's a sort of aging immune system. 
So critical to moving treatment forward is understanding the biology of the disease, and that's what's really changed in the last few years. The next step after that is defining, de 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 defining and, de and uh, identifying treatments that will switch those uh, sort of broken switches off, if you like, and then, then we have to prove that they work. And so uh, I'm going to go through these sort of uh, four points, really, uh, in my talk. I'll try and, uh, not, not in great detail, but just so you see where we're going and what's happening in terms of CLL. So in terms of understanding the biology, uh, a lot of our treatments, like chemotherapy, for example, which Patrick showed you was what we do, um, you know, we've done for many years, for so 60 years we've had chemotherapies and we've improved them and FCR's an effective treatment, but it is uh, not targeted to the disease, so we're basically hitting it with a hammer and trying to, to squash it into submission, but, we, but it has side effects, we knock on other cells as well. And so although we have very effective therapies, which probably, in terms of FCR, will cure 15 or 20 percent of patients, it will cause problems as well. So, so we'd like to move to more specific treatments. And what we've, we've, we know now in CLL is that these CLL cells, this is a cartoon which I made some years ago uh, to try and explain CLL. On the left is, is the peripheral blood, and what we see those cells that Patrick showed you in the second or third slide, with sort of mature um, uh, CLL cells that don't seem to be doing much. But what we, what we do know now is that these cells mimic normal B cells, so they behave like a normal immune cell. So what they do is they, they travel from the blood into the lymph nodes and the bone marrow where they get a stimulus to grow. And then they proliferate very quickly and then they go back into the blood where they switch off. And so the CL cells are following the same path as normal B cells. And what that allows us to do is to understand how does this CLL cell interact with the rest of our body. Because if we can understand that, we can then interfere with those interactions and stop it growing. And so that was a, that's a key part of the way the treatment's changed. Uh, and the second thing, of course, that, that, uh, that CL cells have to do, or B cells have to do, is once you've killed the well, <coughs> infection you're fighting, and you've got billions of, say, anti-measles lymphocytes, they have to, we don't want them anymore once the, the infection's gone. So the cells have to kill themselves. And that bit is very organized. And if it goes wrong, you have a problem because the cell doesn't kill itself. And so what we found in CL, and, and I'm not going into great detail, but on the left, you have uh, the cells that are growing, and this is just some flow that we've done in our lab that shows that there are a proportion of cells, and I'll probably be able to find them, so these ones here, each spot is a cell that we've put through all those flow cytometers. These ones are growing. So a proportion of cells are, are growing in, in any patient with leukemia. And so we know that these are the ones that are just left the bone marrow and the lymph nodes. So in every patient in CLL, that's switched on to a high level, and so that there's an accumulation of cells over time. And then on the other side, every patient has this, uh, this molecule, which is BCL2, which is, stops the cells. It's an anti-death or anti-cell death uh, gene that's switched on. And, and brown means it's, it's switched on. It should be not brown if, it, if there's no BCL2. So these cells, and this is a, this is a, a down a microscope, are, have <coughs> BCL2 switched, BCL2 switched on, so, for, so therefore they don't die. So it's a bit like a sea cell that you've got a proliferation and the cells aren't dying and therefore the cells accumulate over time until they potentially cause a problem. And so what we now know is a lot about both of these pathways which are, are not random events, they're very organized pathways that are very important to all of our cells and we can interfere with them specifically. And so that's what's changed in, in CLL and will change in cancer. So CLL I think is what is the sort of at the front end because we can get the cells, we can understand it, but the other cancers will follow. And so, you know, <coughs> treating CLL effectively with the combinations we're doing uh, will lead, I, I believe, to big advances in other leukemias and lymphomas and also the cancer. So it's a really important sort of um, uh, model, if you like, to, to follow for if you think about or every patient with, with a cancer. So that's, what, that's really where the new treatments have changed, and I'll show you a bit in a bit more detail in a moment. One of the challenges we have in CLL is that our treatments are actually quite effective and, and they're not effective enough, we're not curing enough patients, we're not getting enough treatment, but when we treat a patient in frontline, and Patrick showed you some slides for FCR, the average time in remission is five or six years. So if, we, if it takes us that long to, to, to show a, you know, if a treatment's better, it's going to say last seven years, it's going to take us a long time to do a trial, and we can't wait that long with the changes that are happening. So we have to have what we would call a surrogate, so something which will tell us uh, that this treatment works sooner. 
And what we know from a lot of work, and we've done a lot of work over the, the last 20 years, is the depth of remission. So what, where you finish up at the end of treatment is really important. So if we can get rid of any disease we can find, then patients will have a longer remission. And if we're going to cure a disease like CLL, we have to get rid of the disease. So measuring the disease at the end of treatment is really important. So we call that minimal residual disease, so that's how much we can measure. Now if you think about it, when a patient with CLL needs treatment, they have probably a million, million cells. So there's a lot of cells there, and that we can measure down to one in probably 100,000. So even if someone's negative, there might be a disease that we can't find because it's at a low level. So, so negative doesn't mean there's no disease, it means we can't see it. And so we're sort of improving those tests as well. So I'm, I won't show you all the data, but this is from one of our trials with FCR. And if you take patients with, after FCR chemotherapy and look at the, the marrow at three months afterwards, and then some patients will be negative, about half of them, just over half of them are negative, so we can't find the disease. And then the other half are positive. There's a big difference in terms of what happens to them over the next few years. And so we can use MRD for two reasons. We can use it, first of all, to say this treatment's better, because if you get 80% negative, then that's better than getting 20% negative. And secondly, we can use it for the new therapies to, to consider stopping treatment. So we wouldn't want to stop someone necessarily if they had a lot of disease there, but if we can't detect it, we might be treating them when they don't need any treatment. And so we can use it to define how long we use therapy, and that's what we're doing. And so this is a sort of cartoon to, to, to depict what I'm trying to talk about, really. So on the, on the y-axis is how much leukemia is there in this case, or any tumor. And then the dotted line, the first one, is when a patient's in remission, so that they can't feel anything, the blood count looks normal. The second dotted line further down is, say, a <coughs> thousand times less cells where we can't actually detect them. And so if you, if you uh, go into a remission, if you're on the, the, one of these two blue lines where we can detect disease, we know you're going to re relapse relatively quickly compared to the other patients. If you're on a purple line, we can't measure it here, so we can't tell the difference between the green and the purple line because we can't measure it. If you've got some disease, it's going to come back at some point, but the, the remission is going to be much longer. And then if you're on the green line, you know, you're going to be cured. And so our, we did a lot, of, a lot of maths, actually. We've got a very uh, clever professor of stats in Leeds who's looked at what we, if we get more patients negative, we get more people in the green line. So we can actually work out how we move towards cure with these new therapies, which is obviously our aim. So MRD is important. So the, I've talked a little bit about uh, the, the targeted therapies and, and how we've identified across, you know, globally really, how we've identified uh, the, what to attack. And these two pathways are clearly important. And there are two drugs that are current, well, three drugs that are currently approved in Europe for uh, CLL. Ibrutinib, which uh, was approved about four years ago uh, in Europe, and Mescalax, which was approved about two years ago, and we have challenges in terms of funding, although uh, we may not be able to get it for every patient we feel should be, it should be appropriate to have in the NHS. In England, we have those issues that we have to find. But these two drugs have clearly had a major impact on the outcome of CLL at the moment and are moving forward in terms of frontline trials. And uh, this is a, sl a slide I like because it explains the biology of the disease. So understanding disease and other diseases allows us to develop new therapies. So this chap, uh, Bruton, who's in the American Army, uh, identified, as a physician there, identified some boys who had no immune system. So they, had, they made no lymphocytes. And what, they, what was found in 1993, that these, these boys inherited a deficiency of an, an enzyme, and that enzyme was important to make lymphocytes. So we knew from 20 plus years ago that this BTK, or Brutus cytosine kinase, was critical for making lymphocytes. And therefore, it's actually critical for the, the growth of B cells, the proliferation when you're attacking a bug. It's also critical in CLL, because the CLL cells have it switched on all the time, so, so they're driven all the time by this pathway. And uh, in 2005, then, uh, an inhibitor was made to this enzyme. Uh, it was first put into a human being in 2009. <coughs> Only four years later, uh, this drug was approved and has changed the way we treat CLL. So what's really impressive, I think, is the speed at which you can go from a drug to an approval. And one of the challenges we have, of course, is that these, this drug is given continuously. And when we've approved it, there was only a small, relatively small number of patients treated, so we need to collect information about side effects going long term. There's now, there's now been over 100,000 
patients worldwide treated with ibrutinib. So it's really moved the disease significantly. Um, and I'll just show you one, the, the response in one of my patients from one of our first trials. This is a, a young lady who had failed a transplant, failed FCR, failed bendamustin, and was actually told by the transplant centre locally over five years ago that she wasn't going to survive and she went to home because there was no other treatment on offer. And she was referred to me for a trial uh, in 2013. And uh, it was just when we were getting the ibrutinib trials, before it was called ibrutinib, so we put her in the ibrutinib trial. And uh, this is her, I'll just, this is a scan, so uh, I'll just explain to you. We, we look at scans, this is just to show the picture, we, we, we slice the patients, basically. And we can look, this is looking at the patient from the front, and what you see is, this is her liver. The grey is, uh, is sort of tissues, this is her liver. This is her spleen, which is too big, uh, but it should, should be smaller than that. And all this grey stuff in the middle is big lymph nodes. And so this bit's uh, uh, one of her blood vessels. And then you can see her kidneys are pushed out over to the side of it. And so, and also a blood count's abnormal. So after eight weeks of treatment, you can see the spleen is getting smaller. Uh, the, this this grey stuff, the lymph nodes, got, has also got smaller. Um, and uh, you can see the blood count is improving. And then even at six months, uh, she's got the, no lymph nodes, the spleen's a normal size, and her blood count's normal. So this is a patient who's failed every treatment we had, and I saw her about two weeks ago. She's five, over five years on treatment, so at least the previous best treatment her response was at two years, and she's perfectly fine. And so and she's got a low level of disease, as we can see. So it shows you the impact of understanding the disease and targeting the disease specifically, uh, that we can switch off these cells. The other... Um, uh, Drug is venetoclax, which is also a tablet, and uh, is relatively more recent, but, but persuades the cells to die. And I, and, and, uh, didn't, I took the picture, that actually, the patient actually that allows me to show his picture, but I took it out just for time. But we have a, a farmer up in North Yorkshire who, who also had a very similar story. Uh, they're quite hard, if, you, if you're going to be a farmer in North Yorkshire, you have to be quite hardy in winter, because it can be quite tough. And uh, he failed treatment and came to see us, and uh, went on venetoclax, and this is his scan, so it's the same sort of picture. <coughs> You can see the big spleen uh, on the right, massive lymph nodes, the kidneys being pushed out to the side. After four weeks, the lymph nodes have gone, the spleen's going down. But what was really impressive, and we don't see when I it, but this is his bone marrow. So we do do bone marrow sometimes, particularly in trials, we really have to understand how these drugs work, and that that's where this disease starts. And this is, each spot is a cell, and the, or the orange spots are CLL cells. So you can see in his uh, initial, this is before he started treatment, He's got lots of orange spots and not many other spots. And uh, after six months, we can't find any CLL at all. So he's in a remission where we can't find disease. And this is three years ago, and he's, you know, I suppose St. Helens with Donald Trump's recent statement, but I've, I wrote a letter to get his gun license back because he has a gun in, in, uh, <laughs> in North Yorkshire and he's uh, driving his truck around, he's quite happy. So, um, and this is an oral therapy with no side effects that he's experienced, although we do see some, some slight side effects. So it shows you. In the last five years, the massive changes we've had in CLL. And uh, this slide, and I'm sorry it's complex, but, it, but, it, but it's deliberately complex, is what's changed in the last 40 years in the disease. So, so the top are the trials. So the top are, are our, our own trials from the UK. These aren't drug company trials. They're, they're sponsored by the UK group. And you can see that the first sort of uh, four, if you like, are, are take about 10 years. And so they're really slow, they take a long time to recruit these are frontline patients, maybe seven, eight hundred patients going into a trial. Uh, and the reason they're very slow is because it takes a long time to organise trials, we need to speed it up. But this is the, these are the drugs that were developed, it's actually, Paramacil was 1950, in the 1940s actually, when it started in the 1950s was the first paper. <coughs> there was nothing really for about 30 years in this time scale, we had Flarab and we started combinations. These are the drugs that have come out in the last five years. So we have a huge uh, expansion of the numbers of drugs available with different targets. And uh, that gives us a great opportunity but a great challenge. So we have to be able to move quickly for these therapies into, into, uh, into, <coughs> into treatment. So this is our current uh, UK big trials. We've got lots of small trials as well. So, so we've had a lot of uh, keeping me awake at night trying to keep up with all the trials we're running. So, so it shows you the importance of of the new therapies and at the bottom just just to to uh, is, is really our, our, our tools to understand disease have changed completely so we now can can take a single patient's leukemia and in a week 
sequence every gene in that, in that, in that, in that uh, leukemia and actually find out what's going wrong with it. And that's remarkable compared to what we were doing when I was doing my PhD, which was before Patrick was, was doing his, when we were holding things up to the light to try and work out what was going on. So it's a completely, complete revolution because of the human genome. And so that's really changed the possibilities, I think in cancer generally, but certainly in CLL. And then, uh, just to move on to trials, well, what are trials? Well, trials are, have a variety of different reasons that we do trials. So, so there are, uh, you can split them into several different ways. So you can split them into commercial company trials and our collaborative group trials. So ones that are sponsored by a pharma company effectively, and we work closely with pharma, because without pharma we don't get any drugs, and so we need these new drugs. So it's very important how we interact with, with pharma and biotech. So, but those trials are designed specifically, first of all, to show that a drug is safe, and secondly, to get it approved so that it can be sold. And it, and it has to be approved, otherwise we can't use it in the 100,000 patients, for example, that Abutinib is now benefiting, potentially. The other trials are the, are the collaborative group studies, the ones that we run. We also have all the commercial studies, which are very large trials and change practice. So it's where we add drugs and if you like, we try to beat FCR, for example, and, and move the treatment forward. And those trials will have a, a thousand, the German, the German 13 trial, I think the German group and our group are probably the two biggest groups internationally running these trials in CLR, maybe some American groups as well, ECOG. Um, are those examples of practice changing trials that will actually allow us to go to NICE and to your funders and say, look, this drug is better, this combination is better, and we have to use it. And we have to move more quickly because of the new therapies that are coming through. The other way to look at it is the phase of trials. So you might hear people say a phase one to phase three. So a phase one trial is the first time we put a drug into a human being. And that obviously that's, the, there are risks. We don't know if the drug is going to do what we think it's going to do. And so we have to be very careful and we, and we tend to treat patients who maybe have failed everything else and, and, and have a, you know, a better upside of using that drug. But as soon as we know, and they, they will, that will find the correct dose and once we found the correct dose, we do a phase two, which is a bigger trial, to see if it looks like it works. And a phase three is where we compare it to the standard therapy. And so it's really important to link all those trials together. And I'll try and show you how we're doing that in the UK group. So our challenges in CLL uh, is, the, is the, the rapid changing treat, treatment landscape. So we're moving from, we're not getting one drug every 10 years, which is great, we're getting one every year. And we have to incorporate all those treatments into our into our trials. The standard of care is changing, which is really good. So, you know, FCR is the standard of care for young patients. Clamps the is the standard of care for older patients. But three years ago, that wasn't the standard of care for older patients. So it's moving really quickly. So our trials have to reflect that. We have rapidly emerging new therapies, which we're now combining together. So if we're going to cure CLL or diseases like CLL, it's a bit like curing, for example, infections. So if you, TB, which 150 years ago was a big, the biggest problem. CLL wasn't a problem in those days because we had the infections. The only way you cure it is by using two, three or four drugs together to, to really, if you like, corner the, in that case, the TB bacillus. It's the same thing in, in leukemia. What we're trying to do is corner the leukemia cell so it can't escape. And so the likelihood is we're going to use more than one drug together so we've got it, you know, the boxed in so it can't become resistant. And so the, having lots of different therapies is really important so we can start combining them in a logical way. And I'll show you a bit how we're doing that. And the third thing is understanding the biology. So if patients are not going to respond well to a certain treatment, say ibrutinib, we need to, need to know why. Because if we can find out why, say, 10% of patients don't respond well, we can then change the treatment to make sure those patients respond as well. So it's a lot of the trials are about taking samples from patients on looking them in great detail and say, okay, this group of patients do fantastically well, we'll leave them on this treatment. These patients, we need to, to think of a different way so we can improve the treatment for all patients, not just the ones who, are, who are, have got the most sensitive disease. So this biology to treatment to biology to treatment is a really important sort of change really in, in our thinking of trials. So what are our aims? Well, our aims are different actually. So we have a, a group of patients that, uh, you know, the average age of diagnosis is 71 or 72 with CLL. I see a lot of young patients. I've seen three teenagers with CLL in my career. I get preferred patients who, you know, who are younger. So, it's, so I mean, patients who are diagnosed in their 80s and 90s. So the, the, what patients want and what we should be trying to, 
to deliver to patients are different for those groups of patients. So what the, what the expectations are, so we want to have therapies that are effective across ages and comorbidities. We saw a bit about the fish and the, the, the different patients patient groups have been responding in different ways. We need to, to look at treatments that work there and also patients in frontline and relapse. I haven't, my biases and, the, and the, the data from other disease areas which are less common than CLL, like chronic mild leukemia, is that we're going to get, if we're going to cure CLL, if we're going to move to a very effective therapy, it's going to be the frontline treatment that matters. The first try, attempt to treat patients is your best chance to get a good remission. So we should be using our best treatments early rather than late. And, and, but we have to prove that, it's not, you know, that's, that's a theory that we have to <coughs> demonstrate. We have to make sure that our treatments are safe, so we're putting patients at the moment on drugs that, that continue for the long term, and we don't want to find out in 10 years time, or 15 years time, that there's a, some signal like a heart problem or something that develops on a drug that you've been on a long time. So it's really important we collect information about safety, and uh, what we really want to do is get a short duration of therapy and stop. And then, People can, we, we like seeing our patients, but they don't really like seeing us. They'd rather come less often uh, than they come uh, very regularly. I've learned that over the years. So. so I think we have to decide, are we trying to cure the disease? And some patients we are. Are we trying to eradicate the disease, which is probably linked to it? Are there some patients who just want to get the least uh, intensive treatment to, just to control the disease and mean they can get on with their lives, which, which is appropriate. <coughs> so this, this shows the, the, uh, what we do in, in the UK. So we have really two streams of trials we have, which are predominantly for patients who have failed therapy. These are the early phase trials where we test combinations and we have big frontline trials. So what we do in the early phase trials is we try, we've been trying to accelerate the, the treatment. So looking at combinations of one or two or three drugs or two or three drugs of these targeted treatments to see if they look better, if they look better and they look safe, um, and biologically it looks interesting to move those into the frontline trials where we have a big, big, big numbers of patients where we prove that, patient, that these treatments are better and try and change the trials as we're going. So rather than waiting for three or four years before you design a new trial to actually modify the trials we're going, so we're asking the, the current question against the, the current comparator. And, and what's really important, and, and, uh, and this is a real big team effort, across the UK, it's first of all banking set samples. So getting samples from patients before and after treatment is really important so we understand the response. And so we have a big UK biobank which is based in Liverpool that uh, all, of the, all the patients in the trials uh, their cells are sent to at the beginning and, and later on and, we can, and we've done, for example, we've just sequenced the whole genome of 500 patients because of the biobank samples. It's really important information that will lead forward. And this just shows you some of the, so we have over 1,500 patients, over 1,600 patients. Uh, in March, we had samples stored on at the beginning and later on with, with almost 4,000 samples. And it's led to lots of research, which is what drives the, the treatment. So that's very important. So we've all, I'm not going to show you the, much of the details of the combinations, but we've been looking at how we combine these therapies most effectively. And, and the first, and so the the Bloodwise, which is a charity that uh, became a research fund, funds our, our, our relapsed phase two trials, the TAP trials acceleration program, is what it was called, so we can move things quickly. The first trial we did was this ICICLE trial, where we treated 40 patients with uh, Arbutin, and this was before Arbutin was approved, um, to try and see how it works biologically. And what's really important about this trial, it's not comparative, it won't tell us it's better than the current standard. But what we have been able to do is we've collected lots of samples. So we've collected blood and marrow samples and we've put them in the biobank, we've done lots of research. And then this is just some of the research that's done around those samples. So we can really, in great detail, understand what's happening with those 40 patients and then use that information to design the next trial. And so it's, it's a different sort of concept to a thousand patient trial, but it's a really good way to, to, to move things forward rapidly. So we did that and we and, uh, were publishing the, the, that data. We then added an antibody to it, so we took those, the patients with relapsed di disease and added a to the, to, the, uh, the com to make the combination, see if we can get rid of the disease. And then, we, then we've done a trial called Clarity, where we combine those two drugs, the venetoclax and ibrutinib together, which is a, lo a logical approach to try and get rid of disease and, and look at how much we can get rid of the detectable disease. And uh, so this is what, what we, the plan is, if you like, and this is what we've actually done, and I'll show you just a little bit of information in a moment. So ISCOR I was our first trial, it took a, less than a year, so it recruited very quickly. Then we had the amendment, then we had 
the clarity, and then we, we plan to modify Flare. So Flare is our frontline trial where we where we compare. If you initially we could, we took we we're going to look after 754 pa patients. Excuse me, half of them were randomised in the sort of lottery, if you like, uh, to FCR, half to Ibrutinib the plus Rituximab. But then we realised as we were doing this trial, which starts at the end of 2014, and we'll finish this bit. will finish next month in terms of recruitment. Actually, the thing, well, things are moving forward. We want to add another. Um, so we were then planning to add another arm, the combination, and then, then do another trial, if you like, at the same time, and then carry on with the TAP trials in the background while we test new therapies, which is, which is what's going on. And then potentially have no gap so that we can go onto the next trial and move forward <coughs> chemotherapy-free rather than waiting for the answer and then moving forward. So just to, as an example, we've done Clarice, which we presented uh, at the American meeting about uh, four or five months ago. Um, which is 50 patients, so a relatively small trial where we, com where we combined those two drugs, ibrutinib and metoclax. This is how we did it. So we, we basically gave ibrutinib to get rid of the disease initially from the bulkiness and then added venetoclax. Uh, you can see, and I know that some, some of you may have marrows, we do lots of bone marrows and bloods. It's really important because we learn, we learn a lot of information about the way these, these drugs work. And then the plan is to stop the therapy after one or two years, depending on response. This is a very popular trial. We recruited it way ahead of what we planned. Um, we had to stop some patients because of side effects of ibrutinib. But this, just to show you what happens, this is a, a weeks and months of treatment, up to eight months, so six months of combination. And the green is what we can't detect disease. So in the blood, 40% of patients, we have no detectable disease. And these are patients who had failed previous chemotherapy. And so it's a better response than we would have expected and we'd, we'd planned, we'd said we want to get 30%, and if we got 30% negative, then we would take that, this into the, into the front line where we think it would be more effective. And this is the bone marrow. And actually, it's about 40 or 50% of patients go negative <coughs> with this combination. And so that looks better than the refractory, refractory trial. So this is what we've done now with FLARE. So we've done these trials <coughs> that we showed you, and we've just modified FLARE to add two arms. At the moment, there's four arms open. FCR, Ibrutinib, 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 and Ibrutinib, Rituximab. And then from next month, when we finish the first trial, we'll continue with three arms, which will go on until about 2020. And then we may look at changing it again. So we really move things forward really quickly rather than waiting for the results of the last trial before we do the next trial. And this is a trial, and one of the advantages is that it's open across the country. So we have it geogra geographically available, um, and uh, over 100 centres have been open. Uh, for this trial, and it's only patient who's eligible in the UK should be able to go in it. And that's just a model. We have other trials, we're doing the same thing, so we have multiple other trials. For example, testing whether you need to be on the bruising continuously or whether we can stop it and start it. And there's good evidence that that's a good way to treat, to, to treat CLL. So, so that's our next, one of our next trials. And then the next generation of bruising so we've got ones that are more specific that are in trials, and we've got some trials open now for those as well. So. It's a matter of trying to keep, keep ahead of the, of the curve, if you like. So in terms of CLL, just as to, to, to wrap up, um, the advances in, in treatment have been really dramatic in the last five years, and, and, and it's changed the outlook for patients. There's no doubt we've, uh, that you know, over the last 20 years, well, I've been trying to, or more than 20 years, we've been doing, doing trials with CLL, we've not seen such a dramatic change in this disease in the last five years. And, and it's, now, unexpected that a patient dies with a disease. I mean, that, that's, we're not at the stage where we can cure everybody or, or we can keep people in remission all the time, but there's been a huge change. And, and I showed you two patients that wouldn't be alive today if they weren't in those trials. And, and we have many, many patients like that. And the linking, the understanding of the science is what's driven the improvement in the outcomes. And that's what's really important. We have to... Uh, test these new therapies against our conventional therapies because even in the best world in the world, every patient can't go in a trial because of, because of the, the centers and where, where patients are. And we have to move these therapies into the general population of patients as soon as we can. And that means collecting information about how safe and how effective and how cost effective these treatments are. Because if we can give short bursts of treatments and stop it, even if they're expensive, it makes it more cost effective, for example. So we're collecting all that information. We have some challenges. Um, the, some of the challenges are in terms of trial design. So we have long durations of remission. So I boosted into a really effective drug in frontline. Only 3% of patients progress on frontline I boosted alone. 
So if we're going to beat that, it's really difficult to beat it because it's just such a good therapy. And so we have to look at how do we move to come off treatment and, and improve treatment. So we have to be imaginative in our trials. We need to make sure we follow up patients in the long term. And one of the problems with the commercial trials is they tend to stop the follow up fairly early. And what's really important is not whether you're in remission in five years, that is important, it's whether you're in remission in 25 years or 20 years and, and, and how the outcome is in terms of all the side effects. So it's really important and we've, we've started a long term registry in the UK so all the patients in our trials can be followed forever um, in, in the UK. And then it's really important we collect real world information that's just starting now. So if we're doing trials, the only reason to do trials is to change the way we treat all our patients with CLR. And so we have to collect information across the countries as to you know, what's the impact on survival, what's the penetrance, if you like, of these new treatments for our patients. And so that's where you guys come in and, and, the other, and other patients to try and really collect that real world information. Some countries is easier than others. And there's finally just to thank the group in the UK. So there's a, the red are, the, are our trials group and, the, and the, most of the major centres are represented. We have the university on the right who, who sort of do all the science, if you like, so we, we do a lot of the MRD and all the, the testing within the trials, it's a lot of, lot of work. Uh, the funders, like the, the companies that provide the drugs and some funding, Bloodwise and, and CRUK. Um, and then, of course, the patients and their families because they go into the trials and they trust us to have the right design. We, we, we sometimes don't do trials because we don't like one of the arms of the trials. So we only do trials really if we really think that both treatments are, are standard for us. And so we, we, we do have very careful checks. And then the, the, the hospitals and the trial teams that put patients into the trials because it's a lot of work nowadays to, to run a trial. Uh, thanks for your attention.